Hi, this is Sandy Bapti, and this architectural tidbit is about the creation of Audubon Park. From about 1810 to the 1870s, New Orleans expanded upriver with independent subdivisions of the old long lot plantations. One tract of 12 and a half arpents remained, and thanks to the post-Civil War depressed economy, was sold to developers who envisioned a public park. In this map from Richard Campanella's Time and Place in New Orleans, you can see the plantation property lines of the Fusher Tract that became Audubon Park, the zoo, and Tulane and Loyola campuses. The 1834 Zimple map shows the Fusher Plantation buildings, gardens, and an alley of trees that led to Nyad Streets, later renamed St. Charles Avenue. Downriver was another sugar plantation that had been owned by Jean-Étienne de Boré, who successfully granulated sugar on it in 1795. In 1854, that plantation was subdivided and named Berthville. Today, the alley of live oak trees that crosses Magazine Street and ends at the Newman Pavilion, as well as other ancient oaks, are thought to have been part of the Fusher Plantation. Renamed Upper City Park in 1879, the tract was not landscaped for 20 years as funds were not available. In the meantime, Tulane and Loyola Universities began planning their campuses on the lakeside portion of the tract, and along St. Charles Avenue, mansions and private residential streets were being built. With both river and streetcar access, the undeveloped park was chosen as the site for the World's Industrial and Cotton Centennial Exposition of 1884 to 85. While not a commercial success, the exposition had an impressive build out. The main building encompassed over 33 acres or 12 city blocks with 25 miles of aisles and an area three times the size of the Superdome. It would have covered a large part of the current golf course, and these brick ruins in the lagoon are supposedly part of their foundations. Most exposition buildings were temporary structures in a fanciful Disneyland-like mix of Victorian-era styles, except for Horticultural Hall, which was essentially a greenhouse for exhibiting plants, lasting until it was destroyed in the 1915 hurricane. It was a prime attraction, 600 feet long with a 110-foot tower built of wood with electric lighting, a new technology enabling visits at night. The name of the park was changed in 1886 to Audubon Park, honoring the naturalist and artist John James Audubon, known for painting parts of Birds of America during his travels in Louisiana. Beginning in 1893, park leaders were corresponding with several well-known designers, including Frederick Law Olmsted, who due to ill health was passing his firm on to his sons. Olmsted Brothers was hired and worked on the park incrementally until World War II. This preliminary plan shows Olmsted's signature features, a necklace of lagoons and carriage drives around horticultural hall and a large open meadow. Olmsted is considered the father of landscape architecture in the U.S., but he had an interesting and varied life. Working as a journalist, he traveled the antebellum south, including New Orleans, and to New England, and to England visiting gardens, where the picturesque movement in landscape design most likely informed his plan for New York City's Central Park that he and Calvert Vox had won in a design competition. He believed that public parks and cities were a necessary antidote to the hazards of urban life. The design of a pastoral landscape was to incorporate elements of nature. Pathways should be winding, tree plantings in natural groups, water features in organic shapes. Large open meadows encouraged bucolic recreation. Rustic shelters also reinforced the sense of wild nature. Olmsted also understood the importance of classical symmetry and employed it at major entrances, which private donors would fund. All of these features can be found in Audubon Park. Thanks and see you next time.